especially during this crisis of the coronavirus pandemic. The congregation will please stand, and we are going to go and ask you, those of you who are the Quinn members should know this, uh, our call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within our gates, O Jerusalem. For the sake of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. It is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth and sing his praises. We shall now sing to his praises. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Let us now sing our opening hymn with joy and exuberance. Would all who are able please rise for the reading of God's word. You will find today's scripture in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, and we will be reading verses 13 through 15. The book of Joshua, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. I'm reading from the King James Version, and it reads, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto the servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the word of God. It is profitable for doctrine from all that dwell. Oh 
<laughs> How many of you thank God for his goodness Amen. and his mercy and his grace? How many of you know there's nothing too hard for God? You know, God loves you so very much. He loves you so much that he sent his son to stretch his arms and die for you. But you know, the good news is he got up in three days. And because he lives, we can all face not only tomorrow, but today. Is there anyone that has any prayer requests? If you got a prayer request, just start thinking about that situation and that person. And really just let this resonate in your spirit. There is nothing too hard for God. Before that problem even occurred, God already had a solution. Before you even knew there was an issue, he had already sent a response. But he wants you to open your mouths and open your hearts to him. There is nothing too hard for God. Would you, would you bow your hearts before the Lord, please? Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are, Lord God, omnipotent. You have all power, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that you have all knowledge, Lord. Nothing ever takes you by surprise, Lord. Before there was even a coronavirus, Lord God, you knew what was coming, Father. And Lord God, you'd already provided the solution, Father. Lord God, we get our eyes off situations and circumstances, Lord, and we look at you, Father. We look to you, Father God, for Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, Father. Lord God, we're running a race, Father. And sometimes in the race, Lord God, there are challenges and difficulties, Father. But Lord God, we thank you, Father God, that we know that Jesus promised that he'd never leave us nor forsake us, Father. We thank you, Father God, that in the midst of the situation, Lord God, you're in the midst of us, Father. Therefore, Father God, we strip away every worry, Lord God, every fear, Lord, every doubt, Father God. We refuse to feed fear, Lord God, and we feed our faith with your word, Father. And your word says, Lord God, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Lord God. Your word says, Father God, that you loved us so much, Father, that you poured your Holy Spirit out in our hearts, Lord, that we could love like you, Father. And Lord God, in this time, Father God, we come, Lord God, bringing before you, Father, the needs of your people, Lord God, every situation, every circumstance, Father, and we lay them at your feet, Father God. Lord God, we know that as we praise and worship you, Father, our problems and situations shrink, Lord God, as you are magnified, Father. Lord God, we, got, we have our eyes on you, Lord God. We know, Father, that there's nothing too hard for you, Father. Therefore, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that every need of every man, woman, boy, and girl be met this day in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we believe even right now, Lord God, that coronavirus is bowing its knee to the name of Jesus, that solutions, Lord God, are being developed right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you're touching hearts and minds in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, that this pandemic virus, Lord God, will be brought to its knees in Jesus' name. For you said that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Father God, we thank you right now, Lord God, that financial situations are being blessed for your people in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, that bereaved families are being comforted in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, that bodies, Lord God, that are being attacked by diseases, Lord God, are being healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, that relationships are being restored right now in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we know that the enemy is doing this for evil, Father. But because of our faith in you, Lord God, we know you're working it for our good, Lord God. That we're going to come out of this, Lord, stronger than we went in, Father. 
And Lord God, as we look, Lord God, we look for you as Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, our victor, Lord. We look to you, Father. Now, Father, we ask that you'll bless our pastor, Lord God, Pastor Rice, Sister Jennifer, Lord, their family. We speak, Lord God, blessings, healing, and health over them in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father God, we ask, Lord God, that you stir up, Lord God, the preacher and pastor right, Lord, that he will have a fresh anointing, Lord God, and he'll preach with boldness, clarity, and inspiration, Father. Lord God, prepare our hearts, Lord God, to receive your seed, Lord. And as your seed falls in our hearts, Lord God, it, they'll, it'll find good, good soil, Lord God, and the seed will become a harvest, Lord, and the harvest will be fruit for the kingdom, Father. We thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your mercy, your loving grace, and your kindness, Lord. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I've had some good days. I've had hills to climb. I've had some weary days.
So I said, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I will, I will proclaim. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. We won't complain. Glory to his name. Amen. Glory to his name. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Glory to his name. Glory has been so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh my, thank you, Noel. Oh Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. My, my, my. The word today comes from the book of Joshua. Amen. Chapter 5. Amen. Glory to his name. Joshua chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Reading from the New King James Version. Now when Joshua, <clears throat> excuse me, was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Amen. I want to address today's message with the subject, What is your Jericho? What is your Jericho? In our biblical text today, we find Joshua leading the people to the promised land. He and the Israelites have now crossed over the Jordan River. They're now on their way to the land that God had promised to give them. However, in order to occupy the land, they must conquer the city of Jericho. You see, David has his Goliath. Elijah had his Jezebel. John had the Roman Empire. And Joshua had his Jericho. Jericho stood in the way of the progress of the people of Israel. Jericho was preventing them to fulfill God's promise. Jericho was blocking Joshua and the Israelites from making their dreams a reality. Jericho, a fortified city. Jericho towering like a titan on the barren plain north of the Dead Sea. Jericho's successive walls encircled the stone houses. Jericho, the outer walls seven feet wide and 16 feet high. And on top of the wall was a second wall that was built. This one eight feet tall. Jericho, where a citadel guarded the north end. Jericho, a thick forest of palm trees, eight miles long, three miles wide, stood as a barrier 
east of the city of Jericho. Jericho where steep hills protected the western wall. Jericho, high walls and protected sides. Joshua and his soldiers had never faced such a challenge. They had fought battles in the wilderness, but always on their turf in terms in an open plain. Never had they fought a fortified city. They had never went up against such an opposing figure. They had never passed this way before. The reproach of slavery in Egypt is a distant past. The parting of the Red Sea was a joyful ending. The crossing of the Jordan River was a confidence builder. The manna from heaven on high in a parched desert was extremely satisfying. Now Joshua stands at a distance and sees this fortified city that must be conquered in order to get to the land promised to them by God. God has given them the land. They are there trying to occupy the land, but Jericho is in the way. Jericho was the strongest city in the promised land and the first that they had to conquer. Isn't it amazing that as they get over the Jordan River, the first city they must conquer is the strongest one? As stated before, Jericho and conquering it will be different for Joshua because they had never fought a fortified city. In other words, they've never been this way before. They're just strange. This is different. It's not the normal kind of struggle. It's unique. It's unusual. Joshua and the Israelites had never come against anything like this throughout their entire journey to the promised land. Not even Moses had to deal with a fortified city. Yet, in order to occupy the land, they had to conquer Jericho. The future, the livelihood, the independence, the freedom, all depended upon them conquering Jericho. They couldn't go back because the Jordan River was still there. And I don't think, now I'm just hypothesizing here, that God was going to part the water for them to go backwards. Because God is not a retreating God. He's a progressive God. So they had to establish their freedom in Jericho. The problem is they never experienced anything like this before. Conquering Jericho will be a new experience. Old strategies will not suffice in conquering Jericho. Perhaps you today are facing a challenge unlike you have ever faced before. It looms on the horizon like an angry Jericho, imposing its figure, strong in its challenge, fearful in its observance. It consumes your thoughts, saps your strength, wakes you up, keeps you awake at night. It's ancient, thick-walled, and unconquerable in your mind. It's the biggest challenge of your life. It sits between you and your promised land. Like Joshua. You can see it like Joshua. You must face it like Joshua. You must conquer it. What is your Jericho? Is it the fear of the coronavirus? Is it the possible closing of your business? Is it being laid off from your job, not knowing how you're going to keep a roof over your head and food on your table? Is it being quarantined from your elderly parent in a nursing home? Is it the death of a loved one? Is it a relationship that appears to be irreparable? Is it the shutting down of the schools and university, not knowing if it will reopen this semester? 
Is it an illness that's robbing you of your peace? What is your Jericho? What is the one battle you must win in order to fulfill what God has planned for your life? Are you intimidated by its size? Do you think you don't have what it takes to conquer it? Do you feel small in its heights like the Israelites said? We look like grasshopper in their sight. What is your Jericho? All of God's people would have to face their Jericho and to subdue it. Because God's people goes from strength to strength, Amen. as well as from difficulty to difficulty. Hmm. All over the world, we are facing our Jericho of the coronavirus. It also looms on the horizon like an angry Jericho, imposing its figure throughout the world, strong in its challenge. Fearful in his observance, it consumes our thoughts and excites our fears. It saps our strength and wakes us up each morning. The world has never passed this way before. Yet, we must conquer our Jericho in order to subdue the unsettled nervousness and rapid panic throughout the world. Since we are facing our Jericho, and we have a universal Jericho, but yet some of us have individual Jerichos. Allow me to share with us three support statements to encourage us while we are facing our Jericho. First of all, what Joshua immediately learned and what we must also learn is that when facing our Jericho, there is the precept of impossibility, but there's also the promise of omnipotent help. In other words, Joshua, like us, did not have to face his Jericho alone, and nor do we have to face our Jericho alone. The scripture informs us that when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up and asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And I have now come. Hmm. Joshua is looking at this imposing figure of his Jericho. He's wondering now what new strategies can he implore to conquer his Jericho. <laughs> Joshua sees two armies. The Canaanites, the enemy army. The Israelite, his army. But actually there was a third army that Joshua was unaware of, and that is the Lord's army, God's angels. This is the same heavenly host referred to in Psalms 103, verse 20 and 21. Bless the Lord, you mighty angels of his, who carry out his commands, his order, listening for each of his commands. Yes, bless the Lord, all you armies of his angels who serves him constantly. Dismiss the notion of angels with chiffon wings and rosy cheeks. God's angels were strong enough to close the mouths of lions for Daniel. And according to the book of Revelation, it would take only one angel to bind Satan and to cast him into the bottomless pit. Just one angel can dispense with the devil. So imagine what thousands of angels can do. The message to Joshua is unmistakable. Jericho may have its strong and towering walls, but Joshua, you have much more. You have God on your side. God is with you. Isn't that the word Joshua needed for his moment? 
and conquering his Jericho, a reminder of God's mighty presence. And isn't that that we all need for today? We need to know that God is near us and that we are never alone to fight our Jericho. In our darkest hour, in our deep questions, the Lord of hosts never leave us. We will never face our Jericho alone. This is the promise that God gives us. All authority belongs to God. All he needs only to just lift a finger. Thousands upon thousands of angels of his might will respond to his call. His presence is part of our inheritance. He will come to us, you know. The Lord will come to us. He may come through his holy word. He may come with the kindness of a friend. He may even speak to, who, to us through one of his religious books. But this is for certain. God comes to his people. When God comes to his people, guess what happens? The atmosphere changes. It reminds me one night when our sons were very small. In the middle of a storm, the wind would brush a branch against one of the windows. And they shouted, Daddy! I did what all daddies did. I told their mother. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. I walked down the hall, stepped into their room. When I did, the atmosphere changed. Strange noises, odd sound, didn't matter anymore. Why? Daddy was here. Strange sounds of the coronavirus, odd sound. We need to know that our Heavenly Father is here. He is our commander. He's here with his heavenly host. He's here to fight our battles. He's here to encourage us. He's here to boost our confidence. He's here to secure us. He's here to assure us that Jericho is beatable. When your atmosphere changes, it's when you invite your commander with all of his heavenly hosts to come near to you, to help you, to fight your battle. He is well able to conquer our Jericho. Because the scripture says that if God is for us, who can be against us? We may have our Jerichos, but we also have our God. In addition, when facing our Jericho, we must trust the uplook. What do you mean by that, Pastor? We must turn our focus away from Jericho because we looked at it long enough. Are you facing a Jericho level challenge? Do you face walls that are too high to breach, too thick to crack? Do you face a horrible diagnosis, difficulty or defeat? that keeps you from entering your promised land? If so, do what Joshua did. When Joshua was near Jericho, and this is what the scripture says, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, what did he see? A man stood opposite him. After Joshua lifted up his eyes, what he really saw was a manifestation in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. As long as our eyes are on our Jericho, we won't see Jesus. As long as our eyes are on our difficulties, we won't see Jesus. We must look up. David said, I will lift my eyes unto the hill from which cometh my help. And my help comes from the Lord, mm, who made heaven and earth. We must trust the uplook when facing our Jericho. What we keep our eyes on will affect us. We will produce what we are constantly seeing in our mind. If we keep feeding our mind with impossibility, defeat, and fear, 
then we are going to live that kind of life. But if we develop an image of victory, success, peace, and joy, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from us. Too many times we get stuck in the rut of fear because of what's affecting us on the outside. If we're going to stretch our faith to believe that all things are possible, then we must enlarge our vision to capture the uplook. Because the uplook is where God is. And God is able to do more than we can ever think or imagine. God has so much more in store for us to conquer our Jericho. But we must make room for him in our thinking. We must start seeing ourselves rising to a new level of victory and success. I'm reminded in late January 1956, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. received a threatening phone call at his house. It was not the first threatening message that he had received. But on this night, as his children and wife lay asleep, the weight of the civil rights movement was too heavy for him to bear. He decided that the risk was too great. He began to map out an exit strategy. At midnight, he bowed over the kitchen, the kitchen table, and began to pray to God, I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them with our strength and courage, they too will falter. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I come to the point where I can't face it alone. King described what happened next. He said, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never ex experienced him before. It seems as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying to me, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. When facing a daunting challenge, King shifted his focus and turned to God. I'm reminded of a night, another midnight experience. Paul and Silas, this missionary duo, was thrown into a, a Roman jail in Philippi. The jailer locked them in the most innermost part of the prison. He fastened their feet in stocks. They had no recourse and no means to escape. But rather than look at the shackles on their feet and the chains on their hands, they looked up to God. Oh, my God. And the Bible said at midnight, mm, Paul and Silas were praying mm, and singing hymns to God. King went to God at midnight. My God, must be something about midnight and talking to God. Paul and Silas went to God at midnight. Mm. And the prisoner heard them singing and praying to the almighty God. It was at midnight. My God, Reverend, go on and preach anyhow. They were in the deepest part of the jail. No way to escape. But all of a sudden, something happened at midnight. Uh, God responded to the praying and the singing. And God sent an earthquake to shake that jailhouse. And all of a sudden, the chains flew on. And they walked out alive. It's something about trusting God in the uplug. Maybe we've looked too outward too much because when we look out, we get afraid. When we look in ourselves, we see that we don't have enough strength to deal with our Jericho. If you can't trust the inlook and if you can't trust the outlook, I tell you who you can trust. You can trust the outlook because God is still on the throne and he's still well able to take care of our Jerichos in our life. My God. If you're at the end of your strength, you don't have anything left. And you come to a point where you can't face it by yourself. Lift up your eyes, oh you gates, uh, to the heavenly God. And he will be by your side forevermore. And then 
when facing our Jericho. It is critically important, hear me now, all of you who are listening, it is critically important with everything that's going on that we maintain our worship before the Lord. Look at it. Notice now that when the commander of the heavenly host, he's the commander of the heavenly host. You didn't, you're not getting it. He's the commander of the angelic host. Maybe you get it then. He's now standing before Joshua. Introduces himself to Joshua. Joshua recognized that he was in the presence of the Lord. Fell on his face. Removed his sandals. And worshiped the Lord. God, Jericho now is in the forefront. Joshua, a five-star general. 40,000 soldiers salute as he passes by. His tent was the over office. Two million people looked up at him. Yet in the presence of God, this five-star general fell on his face and worshiped the Lord. My God, keep in mind now that Jericho is still in the forefront hmm. with his high walls, protected side. Barrier before Joshua and the Israelite to occupy the promised land. Mm. There is Jericho. Here is Joshua on his knees worshiping the Lord. My God, Reverend, come on now. You're going to bring this thing a little closer. Yet in the midst of everything, mm, the great challenge is still before Joshua. Mm. But Joshua is worshiping the Lord. Mm. As I fast forward while he's worshiping the Lord. Mm. He has no strategy as a how to defeat his Jericho because he's never experienced this kind of warfare before. But while he's worshiping the Lord, the Lord gives him the strategy how to defeat his Jericho. You don't go and run to defeat your Jericho until you first spend some time and worshiping the Lord. My God. Here it is, that as he got his strategy, the Lord told him to walk around the walls seven days. For seven days, Joshua, just walk around the wall. What kind of strategy is that? It's the Lord's strategy. And sometimes the Lord's strategy doesn't make sense to us, but it makes a whole lot of sense to him. When God told Naaman, dip yourself down into the muddy water seven times, didn't make sense to him. And when, when Moses said, I'm going to stretch my rod and the, and the sea will be parted, didn't make sense to the Israelites. I'm telling you, when you're operating the divine, God will give you the instruction that won't make sense to you, but it makes a whole lot of sense to God. And there they are walking around this wall seven times. Don't you see the Canaanites on the wall saying, what is wrong with those Israelites? They done lost their mind walking around the wall seven times. But on the seventh day, the last day, oh, God told him, now, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get the priest, and I want you to blow the ram's horn. And on the seventh note, I want you to give a great shout and let the people shout all over. And as they walked around and stood still on the seventh day, they began to have the priest to blow the ram's horn. And when the priest blew the ram's horn, and they gave a great shout, I'm telling you, all of a sudden, the walls collapsed. But I got something else for you about worshiping the Lord. When you turn to the Bible in the Old Testament also, there were three armies who had united to war against Jehoshaphat. The Israelites were outnumbered three to one. But King Jehoshaphat, he did what Joshua did. He prayed to the Lord. And then he did an unusual thing because normally you put your good soldiers out in front when you go into battle. Here it is. Three armies have united to fight against him and his army and but he did an unusual thing he appointed singers he appointed praise singers he appointed praise dancers to walk in front 
of armies of Israel. Sing it to the Lord and praise him for his holy splendor. At the moment, they begin to sing and give praise him. The Lord calls the enemy army to fight among themselves. And when Israel arrived at the battlefront, all they could see was dead carcasses sewn all over the battlefield because God had already defeated the enemy before they got there. If it didn't, there must be something about worshiping the God that we serve before we go into battle. And when praises go up, we already know that when praises go up, that blessings will come down. And I declare right now, I believe that the United States of America and everybody over the world instead of giving news report about the updates of the coronavirus, I believe that they should declare that on this day at a certain time that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They even said I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continue to be in my mouth. Worship the Lord can do something for you. Worship the Lord can unite what Satan divide. Worshiping can recover what sin destroy. Worship can beautify the world as it's tarnished. Worship can give us something to soothe us while we're going through this thing. Worship can calm our nerves. Worship can heal us when it hurts. Worship can clarify what is confusing. Worship can release what the flesh is withholding. Worship can clear our vision. Worship can clear our priorities. Worship can revive our heart. Preach, women. Worship can remove our attitude. Worship can calm our nerve. Worship can give us trust in God. Worship can give us confidence. Is there anybody in here who is willing to worship the Lord while we are facing our Jericho? I tell you, if there is anybody in here who can lift up their voices, give praise to God for he is worthy. So they worship the Lord. Remain standing, those who are able. They worship the Lord. And they gave him praise. Oh, come, let us worship him. Oh, come, let us worship him. Christ the Lord. Oh, come. And the, and the, and the, and the hymns of the Christmas anthem. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us. Adore him. Isn't that why we're here in worship? To adore him? Isn't that why you're watching um, live streaming? To adore him? For a moment, for a moment, for a moment, wherever you are. Why don't you just come and just stand for a moment and just worship the Lord? Don't look at your Jericho. Don't look at your problems, your difficulties. Don't look at your failures. Come on, Phyllis, and help us. Come on, come on, and just worship the Lord. Come, let us adore him. Oh, he's worthy this morning. Oh, come, adore him. Everybody, wherever you are. Come, let us. Come, let us. The Lord, oh, For he, come, let us everybody adore worship him, worship him, worship him. him. Oh, come, let us adore oh, him. Oh, come, let us adore
brothers and sisters, if you have never received Christ in your heart today, and you're watching us, say to God in your heart and believe it. Father, forgive me. I have sinned against you. Come into my heart. I accept what Christ has done for me by paying the penalty of my sin. And I believe that because of his death, I can have eternal life. If you repeat those words after me in your heart, the Bible says that you are saved by the confession of your mouth. And when the moment comes, go to a Bible teaching church to express your salvation to that congregation. Oh, Christ, the Lord. Come on, church. Come on, everybody. Oh, come, let us adore everybody. him. Come on, queer. Oh, come, let, let us, us adore, adore him. him. Oh, come. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Phyllis. Hallelujah.